Hey everyone, Maury Curtis Dunbar here at Painted Studio, and we are back on a sunny Sunday, uh, Saturday in spring. I'm very happy to be working in the studio today, and we're going to work on some fun spring projects. We're going to work on birdhouses today. Um, I'm also working on some epoxy cups, so we might get to you might get to see some of that today. Not sure, but the first thing I'm going to do is check onto my Facebook page so that I can open this and read your comments, etc. Hey, Maddie, nice to see you. So if I do this, then when I flip the camera down, I can see what's going on and answer your questions instead of trying to peer under the camera. All right, so we're going to start right away. No playing around today. We're going to work on birdhouses. Now I have prepped at one, uh, to a certain point, two birdhouses. This one I've completely painted with black set coat. This one I've partially painted with black set coat. And it's dry and we're gonna move on to the next step. So let me angle the camera down. We're gonna turn this on its side. And I'm gonna turn a little extra light on there so that we can see a little better. And we're gonna play with a couple of different products today. So you, things that you don't often see me using. Um, so just to repeat again, black faux effects, black set coat on here. And, um, then it popped the grain on the wood a little bit, which is common to happen. So I've sanded it down lightly. I don't need a second coat of black set coat on here because I'm going to apply foil adhesive over everything that's black. So for the wooden house, I love this. This is a little log cabin birdhouse. You can purchase these on our website, paintedstudio.com. We carry these so you can get everything one-stop shopping. Now, one, first thing I'm going to do is turn this up on its back. Um, I don't think I can turn it that way. It won't stay. Eh, let's see if I can put a little something under here and prop it here so that... Um, you all can see what I'm doing and I can see what I'm doing. There we go. So I'm deciding the colors that I want to use and uh, on the unpainted part. And I'm going to be using our wonderful Saman wood stain. Um, and we're going to test out a couple different colors. This color is Azure. These are water-based stains. You can use them in all kinds of uh, situations. They are not exteriorated though. So when I, if I put this outside, I'm going to have to put a UV protect and top coat on it. All right. So that color's Azure, which is very pretty. Uh, I'm just going to check a bunch of colors. I know I'm using Navy, so I'm going to compare these with the Navy and we're going to see how it reads. Okay. I'm going to I am not really working with clean brushes today on this. I'm just gonna have to suck that one up. Okay, that's navy. So that's almost black. That navy is very, very dark, which is really pretty. And then this is turquoise. So I'm debating on whether I'm going to go azure and navy, azure and turquoise, turquoise and navy. I don't know. So I need to kind of make that decision. Let me work some of this off of my brush. All right, let's put this there. Let's put that there. Okay, let that sit for a second, then I'm gonna get a piece of cheesecloth. And of course we do carry cheesecloth as well. This is the best cheesecloth I have ever used. Um, and when Martin Hirsch retired and left, uh, finished up with his studio in Louisville, Kentucky, he gave me his source for this. So if you're familiar with um, faux finish schools and faux marketplaces cheesecloth, then you will know what this is like. Okay, I think um, just to make it really fun and springy, I'm going to play with um, hmm, the Navy and the azure, or the navy and the turquoise. Hmm, because I think the, uh, the turquoise and the azure are too close, so I need a little contrast. So here's how I'm gonna go about doing this. 
First, I'm gonna take a little cup. I'm gonna put my turquoise in here. And I'm going to start by staining all of it the lighter color. Because I'm not going to make myself crazy going back and forth trying to do one stripe perfectly one color, one stripe perfectly the other. I'm going to stain this and then I'm going to decide if I want to put a little bit of some of these other colors in here and where I want to put them. And this is going to soak right in really fast because this is very porous and very inexpensive wood. And uh, I have sanded it, but you know this is not an easy bit of stuff to sand, so you could get some a uh, little bit of grain coming up when you do this. All right, let's get in here. Now, the, the one thing I love about the Saman water-based stain is that it is self-rewetting, meaning that if I get this here and do this, but I somehow get a blob here, usually that's a mess for staining because then you have to stain that area right away or it's not going to take properly. Not so with the Saman. Um, you can because it's self rewetting, I could stop halfway through, leave a big old bold line, but come back and brush this over it with more of the same product and the line will blend into itself because of the nature of this product. So this is gonna take a little bit. Yeah, I gotta get in here and get all of these little spots and cross beams and all that kind of stuff. But the log cabin is so cute. I mean, honestly, if I wanted to, I could just leave it black in the turquoise, but I'm not going to do that. Why would I do that? That would be silly of me when I have so many foil options to enjoy. And it doesn't matter that I'm brushing the, the turquoise uh, stain up against the black paint. It would be a lot harder if I had put the black paint where I was supposed to be foil. I'm applying this, the stain. All right, so let me grab my little packet here, my little wad of cheesecloth, and wipe it back so it's not just clumpy and gloppy on here. It just soaks right into the wood so nicely. And again, this is this is not like fine mahogany. So you're not, you're not going to get like a lot of gorgeous grain pattern out of this. You're just going to embrace it as stained wood. And because this is a rustic looking birdhouse, a rustic looking stain job is very appropriate. turn around make sure I didn't miss anything from this direction because you know when you only look at something one direction you only see uh, the spots that are visible and clearly there's a lot more that needed my attention over here a lot more that wasn't visible to me from that direction Back in here with the cheesecloth. Clean off a little more. Now the biggest challenge with any of these inexpensive wooden items, truly, is that um, they're often glued together, so you have to pay attention to where the glue is because that can really screw up a stain job. Because yeah, glue won't take stain the same way at all. Uh, and I don't worry that I get this on my hands because, again, it cleans up really easily being a water-based stain. Okay, so you, so you noticed I said that I put that blop there and I walked away from it. And I, I'm actually going to wipe it back. 
I'm gonna stain the back and then we're gonna come across and stain the front and I'll show you how well that all blends. All right. Um, and when you're staining, unless you come to end pieces, you really want to go with the grain of the wood. Going against it just fights the fights it and you don't get a nice even resu result. You wanna go with the grain. I'm just going at this very casually. Also, if you find that you've gotten this too dark and it feels dry on the surface, spritz a little water on it. It will reactivate and you can wipe it back more. That's one of the great things about this product. Now, you, if you're a Fofex user, you're familiar with stain and seal. Um, this is like stain and seal, only it's just the stain. It's not the seal. There's no acrylic binders in here. There's nothing that makes this um, self-sealing. You have to seal it separately. Okay, let's get this here. This is coming out it's very pretty. And of course, I will turn it around again and get the other spots that I can't see from this side, and then I'll wipe it down. Let's turn this around scrub brush under it so you can see what I'm doing too instead of having it just tip back towards me and nothing else. get in there. I got one spot it doesn't want to go into because my brush was too dry. And come on. Every little spot. Got to get it all. Okay, so I've gotten that all. Again, coming back in with my wad of cheesecloth. stripe of stuff in there. It's an odd angle, so. Look how pretty that's coming out. I love this. This is so pretty. That turquoise is just such a pretty color. Okay, so I said I was gonna come back and do this side that's been sitting there. It's actually still damp, so I'm, you know, this is water-based, so I'm just gonna keep going around and we'll see how it goes. I wanna get that other spot as dry as possible to prove my point to you about re-wetting. been very into blues and turquoises and light purples and stuff this spring um, because I miss my 
my garden in the house that burned down, but good news is we got a new house. That was, I was gonna say, mention it last week, but I needed to wait until all the contracts were signed before it. So we are now moving to a new house um, and I'm very excited about it because the uh, damages were not being taken care of at the old one and our landlord there was being, it was and is being very negligent about the what they're doing. Unfortunately, the house now is six, eight, seven weeks after the fire, full of mold, um, full of smoke smell. No, no efforts have been made to uh, do any damage remission. So clearly we can't live there if there's not even an effort being made to fix any of the damages. All right, let's go up in here. Okay, almost there. And then I'll flip it around and catch any of the missed stops. And there's always missed spots. Even when I think I've done it almost flawlessly, I move it and I've missed stuff. Spread all the way across, and we'll do another white back. All right, now we're gonna do this side. So, I like I said, you can use this product, walk away from it. Now you remember there is this big stained spot right here that I put product on. Hi Desiree, nice to see you. Oh yes, um, Maddie, the answer to your question is yes, we can file a suit against them that's in the works. But right now I'm just happy to know I actually have a home to go to, even though I'm gonna, it's a move. I mean, I just, literally just moved into the other house two years ago. So I'm not really happy about having to move again. When I was younger, I used to love moving. New place, constantly exciting, figuring out how I can set up stuff. Now I hate it. <laughs> there so now I'm going over the spot that I already stained and what's going to happen is the new stain is going to re-wet the old stain and it'll allow it to blend so when I wipe it back you won't be able to tell where the other spot was and um, where the fresh stain starts. I gotta get in here these are awkward little angles but I like this kind of stuff it makes me happy to do. Here. I can stain the door. All right, let's get this. Now, the inside of this whole bird hole here, the entrance to the house. I have sanded it, but it's very coarse in there. So even though I've sanded it and sanded it several times, 
it still wants to sit a little rough so it makes it harder to get the stain onto. Okay, again, turning it this way to catch the spots I've missed. And I always miss quite a bit. You never know how much you miss until you turn it around. Okay. Let's get these little end spots here. And let's wipe back. Oh, I missed some end spots on the other side. Can't wipe back until I get them all done. Um, yeah, I could wipe back before then, but that's it. I prefer to do one wiping if I can get away with it. It's just otherwise I go back and I dab and then I'm fixing and fussing and I don't want to do that. I just want to get it on and wipe it off. Okay, and then the final part here is the roof, the porch overhang. Like I said, found a couple more spots that I missed just by turning it into a different angle. Things you can't always see. Come on, I don't have enough stain on my brush to catch that spot. There we go. Okay, so that whole thing is now, I got a fruit flyer buzzing around here. I had bananas in here. flies. And yes, these little spots are very awkward to wipe off. Um, sometimes I wrap cheesecloth around a stick or a pencil, popsicle stick, anything along those lines. Okay, so now I've stained this whole thing. Isn't it cute, Desiree? Thank you for the sprinkles. Okay, so now I've t done the whole thing turquoise, but I'm gonna come back. Let's do this. Put it back into the container. And then I'm going to take another container, stack them like that so that it uh, saves a little space on the work area. Tiny little bit of the navy blue. I'm gonna wipe my little overloaded brush here. And then I'm gonna come back in here Put a little bit of this navy in. Now, I, my original thought was to make each and every um, one of these uh, dark navy, but I think if I just come in and bring a little bit of the navy in on every other board, that'll give me the, the look that I want. A little more country, a little more rustic looking. OK, 
Okay, let's get a fresh piece of cheesecloth here, a couple pieces. Even on small projects, I make a staining pad like this out of cheesecloth. It's always more than one piece um, because what that does is it allows for um, cushion that keeps you from leaving your finger marks when you wipe back on stuff. Now see how that nice that is, that just that little bit of stripiness there. And then let's come back in and Again, it almost reads purple on here because that of uh, the shade of that navy, but I like how that's reading. Okay, so we're gonna do this this way. Uh, let's see, get there. That looks good. Did that side, did that, that side. All right, so now I gotta get in here and this is always the challenging one to get into that underhang and around the poles. Stain that a darker blue there. Now this would be a little harder to do if I weren't going tone on tone. Um, you know, if this was yellow and I wanted it to be bright red stripes, it, that would be a little more challenging. I'd actually have to go, you know, stripe by uh, what would be log by log on the idea, but. That's not what we're doing. Okay, so we've got this nice kind of country striped thing going on here. And I'm gonna let set this aside and let it dry. And then once it's dry, I'll put foil adhesive on the black paint. There we go, put that back. And then we're gonna move on to our other birdhouse. I know, something different. <gasps> Now this is this is going to be really simple. This is going to be all foiled. So the first thing I'm going to do is foil the body. I am going to stay away from the front right now. I want to get these three areas applied and then I'll start on the front. Uh, and my foil adhesive is set aside somewhere that I can't see. Hang on just a sec. Where did I put that jar? If I stand up, maybe I can see it. Well, I guess I can't. I don't know what I did with it, everybody. I normally have everything sitting right next to me and somehow I've misplaced an entire jar of foil adhesive. Give me one second. I don't know why, but I brought it back to the sink last night. No idea why I would have done that. It's not where it belongs. Uh, I do not remember seeing the finished table that you did with the paper cutouts. 
Um, no, Desiree, the, the table itself just failed. Um, it actually ended up having to be made to go away because it just uh, was more wood rotted than I had been aware of. And uh, yeah, it was just a disaster. So I had to, to make it go away. So I'll have to do that paper cutouts uh, on a piece of furniture again. Just not, not today. Okay. And just for you, uh, just for your information, Desiree, I've done whole murals with that um, paper technique that I've shown you guys. Did bulldog murals. I've done Italian marketplace murals. Oh yeah. Had a lot of fun with the paper and using the uh, paper, handmade papers and, uh, sorry, I got to pay attention to handmade papers and our um, set coat clear. I've used that for tons of things so much. my go-to decoupage method even if it's not for cutout so like when I apply sheet mount music to stuff I use set coat clear and whatever paper it is I'm applying okay here's that now I know it looks like I'm setting it on its side but I'm actually not because the edges of the house allow this to be slightly suspended above things and that makes everything easier when I have to start turning things and painting on them. A little piece of fuzz stuck there. Now, if I wanted these to be perfectly flawless after I've applied my set coat black, I would sand it multiple times and then play, apply another layer of set coat black and sand more if I needed to. Um, I'm not always going for that. Um, we're gonna foil this so the coarseness of the surface will kind of be a non-issue. Okay, so I need, I need a smaller brush to get down in there. Okay, so I'm gonna come in here. And these are gonna be bright and colorful. There's not gonna be, I've done a whole bunch of very sedate birdhouses. Yeah, this is not gonna be, these aren't gonna be those. They're gonna be bright and colorful and shock the birds into wanting to live there because they never knew they wanted it before. Um, is set coat clear better to use than glue the, and why? Okay, um, for multiple reasons, yes. Set coat clear dries harder. It dries in a way that will accept paints and not sis up and have things bead on top of it. It's more durable. It also doesn't dry glossy so that if you wanted to embellish it with paints, your your decoupage with paints and stuff. Um, it's a paintable surface. It's designed to be painted over and therefore it's more stable and uh, more user friendly than just plain glue. And also sometimes your glues can work against you with top coats and set coat does not reject top coats. Uh, and that's a big thing for me. And also I like, quite frankly, I like the durability. It just works better for me than any other product I've ever used. And I've tried Mod, Pod, Mod Podge and I've tried, you know, Elmer's glue. I've tried everything when it comes to doing a decoupage and this that's my go-to for it. All right, let's get the front of the, the dormered window here.
you know, in all my years as a decorative finisher, I've tried a lot of products. And so now as a retailer, um, I'm really experienced in the products that I like and I don't like. And so I'm, I can generally tell you why I don't like using something or why I do like using something. Um, and if I think it's something that you can, eh, you know, this is what I use, but other things work well, I tell you that too. And that isn't always the case. Sometimes it is. All right, so now we have to let this dry, you know, for at least an hour. And quite frankly, it's probably going to dry over the whole weekend since I'm off tomorrow and Monday. Um, and I'll just come back and foil them when I come back next week. Now, the other thing we were going to do, let me see how long have we been on here? Uh, let's see. Sorry, I got messages popping up. Oh my Lord, why are people bugging me? Let's see, what have we got here? Um, hmm. Do you want to see me put the slip coat on cups like this on the turners and have me explain why or if you had enough for the day? Let me know. I'm going to watch on you. Uh, I'm going to give you a second to, to think about it. Let me know if you want to watch me put the slip coat of epoxy on a cup and I'll be right back. I'm just going to go throw these in water while you think about it. Okay, so what did you decide? Do you want to see this or not? Okay, Grace says yes. All I needed was one yes to hear it. All right, so we're going to swing the camera around this way and angle it up a little. So you see here are my cup turners. They're not even turned on right now. Um, and when <laughs> I'm not doing rush orders, my go-to process for doing cups is to put the foil on and then put a very, very thin layer of epoxy on, almost so thin that it won't level nicely. And that's called a slip layer. So what I've done then after that is I will do the lettering on the epoxied surface because it likes to stick better than it does to the foil adhesive surface. So when I cut out letters on my Cricut, it actually loves epoxy to stick to. It's a little crabby on foil adhesive and foils. So then I do the lettering and then I do another coat of epoxy over it. So this is what I'm doing for this, these layers. It's these cups up here, they've all been foiled, but they don't have, and actually I'm using really the wrong term. Slip coat is really what you're putting on something. You put it went to make it slick to make the next layer go on easily. And really what I'm just doing is putting a fine coating on this so that my uh, vinyl lettering sticks better. So I guess slip coat is a poor choice of words for that. All right, I'm gonna mix up a large batch of epoxy because I have some other things that I need to pour. But we're gonna pull this over here and I've got a sponge. Let me get some gloves. And we're gonna do the whole thing. You're gonna watch me pour, pour, pour. Okay. And if you're wondering what these are, um, these are the lids for those these cups. So these cups have a screw-on lid that go like that. And I've put a thin coat of epoxy on these too, and they need another coat. That's what's gonna happen right now as well. All right, so I've got my art resin. You could also use liquid glass. I just happen to be using art resin because I have the big jug of it. And we have part A and part B, otherwise known as the resin and the hardener. These must be equal amounts poured um, and you need to wear gloves because you get this on your hands. The only thing that takes it off is isopropyl or denatured alcohol. And that's A, rough on your skin, B, you know, you're absorbing more chemicals. 
not my favorite thing to do. So definitely make sure you put gloves on. These are bl blue nitrile gloves. Um, I find they, they're better than latex gloves. I hate latex gloves. Um, no, and I'm not allergic to latex. I just don't like the feel of them. I don't like gloves that are that tight. I need something a little looser on my hands. All right, so then here goes the hardener. Okay, and they need to be equal amounts. Yep, there we go. And they need to be dead equal. If you can't measure eyeball like I do, and I don't really specifically recommend it, I just do it because I've been doing it for years, um, use measuring cups. You know, there's plastic and silicone measuring cups made Specifically, they're silicone measuring cups made just for this sort of thing. So definitely take advantage of those if you're a poor measurer or you don't trust your measurements. All right, so let me scrape the last of this stuff out. So they must be equal because what happens if they're not equal, if you have too much resin and not enough hardener or your epoxy, Will, may have soft spots, may never com cure completely, will have sticky spots, and I have done this. I know from personal experience. And what happened was I didn't clean out the, mix the bottom of the container as well as I should have, and so I scraped it, and I poured pure one part of this mix versus the other uh, into the base of a mold, and it just stayed sticky. It's still sticky now. Okay, so what happens when you start to mix up is your epoxy gets a little cloudy. And what you're gonna do is stir and stir, scrape the sides. This is um, a silicone stirrer that a friend of mine mailed to me. So you scrape the sides, you scrape the bottom, you wanna get all of it mixed together. And keep stirring approximately two minutes or until this turns perfectly clear. Now, it might be hard to see when it turns perfectly clear given that I've got clear product on a white background, but I can see it from here. My gloves will help me see. Because if I can't see my gloves, then it's sure not clear. So give me a few minutes. We're just gonna stir this. And I could be stirring more aggressively, but I'm not because it's too close to the top of the pint container. I'm not stirring to incorporate air. That's just sort of what happens when you stir. We're getting there, it's starting to clear now. And almost all two-part epoxies do this. They get just a little haze going It'll look cloudy, and then once you've got it mixed completely, it'll be nice and clear. Okay, we're about done. I'm gonna go grab my torch, which is across the table, because we need that. All right, here we go. Oh yeah, that's nice and clear. I can see the paint down under the, the container. That's the goal, is to get it good and clear. Is liquid gold, is liquid glass cheaper? Um, no, they run about the same. I carry different sizes. So like if you wanted the big kit, like I have the one gallon, this is what you just saw me pour was two gallon kit. It's a gallon of uh, hardener and a gallon of um, resin. 
I just carry different sizes and different ones. They're, they're both um, about the same price. I think liquid glass is maybe a little less expensive, but not by much. Epoxy is not cheap, and if you're buying cheap epoxy, you're going to get the results that cheap product gives you. Um, so if you're not going to buy mine, buy somebody's. All right, we're going to turn this on. Oh, I forgot. I have to plug in my um, cup turners. Let me plug it in. I love when these do this. There we go. Every once in a while I get a plug that wants to be stubborn, even though it was plugged in there five minutes before. All right, I just want to shift this paper so it doesn't roll up and catch up on top of these cups. So here's how I do this, especially with multiples. Um, I'm going to pull this paper a little bit this way. And I put, start with the back one first. Oh, good Lord, there's just too much stuff in my way today. So I start over here with the back one first. I like having them all turning towards me. I find that more manageable. And then I take a little sponge brush. And I'm not a fan of sponge brushes for anything other than this. Sponge brushes and I do not get along. So I take some epoxy and I sort of dribble it all over the surface, but I'm not putting a lot on it. It's a thin coat, so I'm moving it around. And then I'm gonna hold my brush at one end and let the cup turner do the work for me. And all this does is it moves the, the epoxy across the surface and seals up the foil nicely and I'll get a nice smooth surface to apply my transfers to and the adhesive from, the, not the transfers, but the, the lettering cutouts that I make on my Cricut for this will adhere better. It's a better result for me. I, that's what I've personally found. Okay, nice thin coat. And I take the brush and hold it on the end and let it turn. And this just coats the end of the cup too. Thin little cup coating and I'm happy. So now I'm gonna take this one and move it forward. So the point of the way I'm doing this is that I have to reach to the back first. Um, and the reason I do it this way too is so that I don't lose my whole table to cup turners. I then have plenty of room to still work. So then I shove this cup turner forward. Again, dip into the epoxy. Sort of smear it around. And then, again, just holding the brush and letting the cup turner do the work. Okay, and the cup turners making all the noise are these spinet cup turners from um, Michaels. They are not my favorite cup turners. I bought them before I had found these on Amazon. Um, Michaels charges an arm and a leg for them. I just managed to get them very inexpensively because um, I had found them online for them way cheaper than in the store. So that's always something worth checking when you go to Michael's um, because sometimes stuff in the store is way less expensive than it is online. Or sometimes stuff online, I should say, is way less expensive than it is in the store. And I don't know why. I don't know why they do that because they do price match in the store if you found it online. I just never understand. Okay, so that one's done. Here's one of the little wine cups. And again, same process, just smearing some of this on here. And then letting the cup turner do the work. If 
And I like to give it a couple of go rounds too. It's not just one single pass because there's places where the epoxy will be heavier and places where it'll be lighter and it makes a difference um, if you let it do at least two rotations so it gets spread more ev evenly. Okay, and there's this. Come on, let's get down to the bottom here. There's a little right there. Okay. And there's that one. Wipe that in. There's too much product there. And here's the last one. And I used to, you know, race to spread this perfectly while the turners were going. And I'm no, I'm I'm fighting myself here. Don't don't do it that way. Let the turner do the work for you. That's <laughs> work smarter, not harder. Of course, I used to be really afraid of working with epoxy too, thinking it was going to cure up on me in about two seconds after applying it. Somehow, it took me a long time to figure out that epoxy has a lot of open time, a lot of work time, and that I was making my life harder by sweating it all the time. I just want to come through here, get some of the extra off so it doesn't pool up in the bottom and cause me a problem later. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to do, then I'm going to put a second coat on each of these. Now, these have been curing for 24 hours. If they'd cured for 48, I would have to sand them. But because the epoxy is just at 24 hours, all I have to do is brush it. And this food, this epoxy, like most epoxies, is food safe after complete curing, which is 72 hours. And as you can see, I have a little piece of tape shoved in the straw hole so that um, it doesn't get filled up with epoxy. And the tape has a little bit of a silicone coating, um, so that helps keep it from sticking to the epoxy as well. Okay. Get the sides of this one. I forgot to do the sides. Because I'm a dork. There we go. And then we hit it with the torch. We start with the pull our sleeves back. And then I go waving this over the top to raise the bubbles and um, pop them. You can use a heat gun too. Now I could torch each one before I do the next, but I don't need to. I have enough work time here. And I got a little pocket that didn't get covered right there. I have enough work time that I can go back in if I needed to and add more like you just saw me do. But all I want to do right now is remove bubbles. And it's a little, I know you guys can't catch this on camera, but um, 
doing this, if you've ever done a boxy, it's like watching soda bubbles pop. You wave the heat over it and all this, it looks like the surface is sort of sizzling. And it's not, it's just popping air bubbles. spots here. Let's turn that off. We'll thin up at the top. And you, I know you guys can't see this on camera. Um, this is something that you have to be sitting in the right place, catch it by the light, and see um, where you've missed. It's almost impossible, unless I had this on a really tight close-up, which I can't do at this very second because then I'd be um, messing with my camera with epoxy fingers, and I'm not doing that. This also, the heat also makes the epoxy more liquid, which is part of why the bubbles raise up so nicely, but it also then the extra heat helps it level a little bit more. Okay, so we're gonna do this on the lids. Okay, those are done. And I think that's going to uh, finish us up for the day. Now, uh, let's swing this back this way. And pull my gloves off and flip this up. Okay. So that's my first step towards epoxying a cup. I have always preferred to add a little slip coat or a little thin layer and do my lettering over it. When I've been rushed, I've had to put the lettering under the epoxy without putting that little thin coating on. And while it looks good, I personally know the difference and I don't feel that the lettering adheres as well. So we're gonna come back. These are gonna turn for a good eight to 10 hours. And then we'll come back on uh, Tuesday and I'll start doing some of the lettering. All right, everybody, have a great Saturday. Thank you so much for popping in with me. Stay well, stay safe, and enjoy. Bye-bye.